Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the MTG Goldfish Podcast, episode 107. 107. It's It's uh, been quite the weekend. All three of us are extremely exhausted, but uh, we made it to podcast. Uh, this is the podcast, your weekly uh, Magic the Gathering podcast, just talking about everything Magic the Gathering related. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, mtggoldfish.com, and now on YouTube. So, hello, YouTube. Joining me as always, Richard, the owner of MTG Goldfish. What is up, Richard? How about those Falcons? I just had to get oh. in there. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, our resident budget brewer, jank uh, constructor, and all-around uh, content creator for everything Magic the Gathering related. What is up, Seth? Oh, what's up, guys? Just recovering from crazy weekend, crazy Super Bowl, Pro Tour, quite a weekend. Yeah, I, I have like an eye in each direction. I'm like like cross-eyed. I, I'm like so tired. I'm exhausted. So yeah, Chaz joining you as always. Uh, I, I produce content, just everything Magic the Gathering related. So um, on the docket for today, uh, we are going to analyze the Pro Tour, everything related to the Pro Tour, just an overall summary, some metagame discussion, um, just overall uh, talk about the coverage, what we thought about that. A, a controversial judge call, which I knew we were going to talk about, so we're, we're going to touch on that. Uh, so just um, We're going to mention some stuff about the teams, like jerseys, cheering, you know, just stuff like that. And then we're going to wrap things up with some fish mail. So let's just jump right in. Uh, I will pose a question to both of you. What did you think of the Pro Tour just as an overall thought about it? Richard. Well, first, let me give a, a one-minute summary of the Pro Tour. So, so day one... The meta game was basically uh, a third copycat, a third green black snake or delirium, and then a third Mardu vehicles. Uh, there are very few new brews. Basically, all of the decks uh, we saw from week one and week two, and uh, some of the older decks like Mardu vehicles came. Uh, by day two, copycat uh, kind of just dropped out of the field. They had an abysmal like thirty five percent conversion rate. Uh, so it's basically Mardu and green black. And then we ended up at the top eight, which was six Mardu vehicle decks, uh, and uh, one uh, green black and one Jund energy, and Mardu vehicles won. Uh, Scrap Eats Grounder, Heart of Kiran, those were the most played cards, and that was the Pro Tour. And at first I thought it was a bit lame, that was my initial impression, because normally you see some spicy brews, but when... The first couple of feature matches roll around and you see Mardu vehicles and green black decks. You're like, uh oh. Uh, but if I sit back and think about it, it's actually a pretty good metagame. You have kind of rock, paper, scissors going on. You have aggro, you have mid range, uh, you have control or combo. And Mardu vehicles look scary, but that's a deck you can beat. You can play gear hulks. You can go slightly bigger. You know, you can beat this deck. It doesn't seem too oppressive, even though it's everywhere. So coming out of the Pro Tour, I actually think it's pretty cool. Uh, I don't think this Pro Tour will define the metagame at all. I think it'll continue to evolve over the next couple of weeks because uh, these decks, even though they're really good, they seem beatable. It seems like you can do something about it as opposed to Emrakul where, you know, you just play your own Emrakul. That's it. You really can't get around that. So I kind of liked how the metagame and how the decks kind of fell out of the Pro Tour, even though the top eight was uh, a little mundane with the Mardu vehicle mirrors. Seth, same question. And great point, uh, Richard. Uh, well, in one sense, I agree with Richard. I think that the metagame is more hopeful than it would appear if you just looked over the list of the best performing decks from the Pro Tour. I think it is true that it was just like this weird perfect storm of stuff where everyone played Jeskai, but Mardu Vehicles beat it and it ended up looking like this really dominant performance for Mardu Vehicles. Not that that deck isn't good, but I think it's as much a product of what the Pro Tour metagame looked like as the actual power level of the deck. So from a big picture perspective, moving forward, I also am hopeful that we're going to see uh, Mardu vehicles kind of drop down a notch. Maybe now that control decks know what they're up against and that their enemy is primarily like Mardu vehicles and secondarily the green black decks that they can adjust because control in general just had a really tough weekend uh, because of the presence of the vehicles deck that they weren't really ready for. But I think that maybe there's a way you can build a control deck to at least have a somewhat decent matchup against the vehicles decks. So in that sense, I'm pretty happy. On the other hand, as someone who 
likes viewing the Pro Tour, I think this might be my all-time least favorite Pro Tour I've ever watched. Like, from start to finish, the Swiss rounds, we saw Grixis improvise the very first, first round for the rest of the entire tournament. Something like 80 or 90% of the matchups were uh, one of the three big decks, the Sahili combo deck, the green black deck, or the Mardu vehicle deck. By day two, I think we had four or five rounds in a row where every feature and essentially every backup feature was green black versus Mardu. And then by the top eight, it was just Mardu vehicles for the entire time. So as someone who wanted to watch an exciting tournament, I didn't enjoy this pro tour at all, but I'm still hopeful about the standard meta moving forward. Yeah, a lot of great points. So a, a lot of stuff was already said. So th- I think the good thing we could take away here is that, like both of you said, there's no. It, it seems like this will not define the meta going forward. Obviously, you see some strong decks, but I don't think it's just like Mardu vehicles the whole way, and the the top eight is not indicative of what we're going to see going forward. I, I think there's a couple important points here too, just from a player's perspective that. You know, you got a a wide variety of decks. Now, you know, Control obviously had his struggles, like you said, Seth, and we're going to go into this at least a little bit more in depth. Um, You wrote an article by the numbers that we'll get into, but uh, Control was a little, you know, struggled, and which is which is actually a little surprising because uh, you would think with all the pro teams testing all the, uh, you know, all this time, and how do you not know that like vehicles is going to show up in such large numbers? So I don't. It was a little awkward to see that they weren't ready to combat that like as well as they did or, you know, not as well as they did. And again, from a player's perspective, you got to see a few decks that are actually may not have been successful at the Pro Tour, but you can easily see them at FNMs or SCGs going forward, like those improvised lists that while they didn't have a great showing and some of them didn't even show up like in the deck list results because they just had that poor of a uh, a record, you know, that's something that people can build on a budget it's like a, a probably like less than 200 bucks and you can see those at fnms and maybe even scg tour like you know that gets refined a little bit and we can see that on that level um i don't think you know i think coming into it sahili everyone thought sahili was just going to take over and you know from the two weeks it seemed that way but everyone seemed really prepared for it and i'm g- really glad i was really concerned that aggressive decks just were not going to show up but that is the tool you need to beat these kind of decks. And it, I said it the last time, and I'm happy that Pro Tours agreed, so, or Pro Tour teams agreed. So that's kind of my take. So just to comment on the lack of cool decks, I had the funniest tweet ever. Someone tweeted at me saying, you know, where's the paradoxical outcome deck? And uh, he listed the the player who, who ran it. And I looked up the Watsi article, and the Watsi article was a paradoxical outcome deck. But it was about a deck this guy didn't play because it was not good enough against the field. And he ended up playing another deck. But the whole article was about this deck that he did not decide to play because they literally had nothing spicy to talk about. So I found that hilarious. <laughs> you had to write an article about a play chess deck because the decks you had were not interesting. But So what do you yeah. guys think of Heart of Cure Ed? Uh, one of the breakout cards, I think when we first found out about it on the cast we're all like this this seems dumb it seems broken and uh it did pretty dumb things on camera you know playing a heart of kiran playing a gideon removing a loyalty from gideon and then plusing gideon and attacking uh just just with the heart of kiran was you know a crazy swinging damage and you saw marty vehicle decks kind of just win out of nowhere uh so did you like the card better than copter or worse than copter did we just replace copter with heart of kiran like what do you think of the card I think it basically replaced Copter. I don't think... I mean, uh, obviously Copter was really powerful. And I, I do think if you were going to compare the two cards, I'd have to edge out Smuggler's Copter just a, like as a pure magic... Like just straight up magic card. But Heart of Kieran really did a great job at filling that role. And uh, like I said, it was it was a huge boon to aggressive list to kind of fall back on this card and not have to scramble. And, oh, we don't have Smuggler's Copter anymore. What do we play? Like our aggressive deck's pretty much done because we don't have an, an option so obviously heart of kieran again just was all over the place because there, there were so many different aggressive archetypes i mean not even just mardu vehicles i mean the, the constrictor list can play it we saw like uh, martin yuza with the uh, jund energy aggro go pretty deep into the tournament we saw these black red lists go deep into the tournament so every aggressive list was uh, uh packing for heart of kieran because it's just that good i i mean i think that 
Smuggler's Copter is pretty clearly the better card. I think in Mardu vehicles in specific, that you probably can make an argument that maybe Heart of Kirin is better. It's bigger. It lines up really well with Liliana and the loyalty amounts as far as shooting down a Liliana and so forth. So it does some really good things, which helps it fight against like the black green deck. That's why we didn't see a lot of Liliana's. I think in the black green decks is Liliana is just so weak to Heart of Kirin. On the other hand, if you look at the big picture, I think in general, Smuggler's Copter is clearly better. We didn't see blue white like at all the zombie decks that really relied on smugglers copter were extremely fringe uh, a lot of the other archetypes that smugglers copter was supporting it kind of just disappeared from the metagame altogether with the change to heart of kirin from a big picture perspective though let me ask you this are these cards just too good did wizards just go too far with the best of the vehicles in general maybe overshooting to make sure that they saw playing constructed i mean maybe they're too good i think the big problem is they're colorless scrap heat scrounger heart of kiran smuggler's copter walking ballista you can put them in basically every deck without any downside and i think that's what the problem is like imagine if fatal push was colorless well you just put it in every deck and there's like no question about it right and i think these colorless aggressive slash recursive slash utility creatures are really strong, and there is no downside to playing them. They're colorless. Like, if Copter was gold, or even just, like, you know, a, a color, like, red or black, I, I think it would be not as powerful. And same with these other cards. So I, I think colorless is where they, they kind of went wrong here, where anyone can play these cards, so everyone will play these cards because they're good, and there's no downside to putting them in your deck. I think that's a good point. I mean, the core, again, which ha- we've seen across multiple archetypes, is the Heart of Kieran, the scrap heap scrounger and the ballista like that maybe not the ballista so much in the vehicles decks but i mean scrap heap scrounger card can't like all these colorless based aggressive i guess shells are just so easy to to play across a wide variety of archetypes i guess i'll throw the question then back your guys way do you think if smuggler's copter wasn't banned that they would have been playing for smuggler's copters or they probably still would have been playing for art of gear okay i i think the copter is the best, but Heart of Kiran's like probably like ninety percent of a copter because you get right. to loot. <laughs> Lo- looting yeah. is like looting is key, and eh, maybe maybe either Sphere Harvester could kill a copter, but not a Heart of Kiran. But I I don't know. I think copter the looting is just too good, and the crew cost is significantly less, and you don't get those awkward draws where uh, you have multiple Heart of Kirans in your deck and nothing's going on. Uh, like we saw in the finals uh, a lot of the times yeah. where oh, I got two Heart of Cure ends. What do you have in your hand? I have two Heart of Cure ends as well. And they're all just sitting there <laughs> making the worst blocks possible so that they can just get rid of these Heart of Cure ends and just cash them in for like four life. Um, yeah, I think you'd start with four Smuggler's Copter and then Heart of Kirin would be like Copter's eh, five and six, maybe five, six and seven, something like that. But I think that that would still be the default. Another question, now that we're talking about Heart of Kirin and stuff, if you remember back a few years ago, they changed the legendary rule to make it, I guess, feel less bad. The The most recent one before they changed it was if there were ever two of the same legendary permanents on the battlefield, they just both went to the graveyard. Now you can each have a legendary permanent. Do you think it would be better under the old ruling? Like, do you think having... Uh, having the Heart of Kieran's legend rule each other would make them a little bit more fair and a little less oppressive? This is my personal opinion. I, I don't really know if we should change the ruling just based on... I mean, I know we're kind of just living in the moment, but I never really liked the, the recent legendary change. To me, a legendary creature or artifact or, or whatever is legendary, meaning there can only be one on the battlefield. So that, that made a lot of sense to me as a player. Cause it was like, Oh, that's a, that makes sense. There can't be like two legacy weapons or two, you know, whatever. There's only one of them in existence. So that always made sense to me. So it kind of, I guess they kind of opened it up to just be a little bit more accessible and people to just kind of just be like, all right, well I get to play mine as well. But I know we're talking about it in the moment. I don't know if we should revert it, but I just me personally, I understood where, you know, that ruling came from. I prefer the new rule. I mean, yeah, lore-wise, like, whatever, but a lot of weird stuff happens lore-wise when you talk about gameplay, so I don't right. like that argument, but I dislike 
the fact of people including cars just as removal. Like, the only thing dumber than having two GTAs is having a GTA with no creatures in your deck just as removal, <laughs> right? So I dislike that. In terms of the metagame, I don't think it changes anything, right? If your opponent has Heart of Kirans, uh, you need Heart of Kirans, whether you're actually using it to crew and block their Heart of Kiran, or you're just using it as straight legendary rule removal, the result is you still have to run Heart of Kirans because everyone else is running Heart of Kirans. So I, I don't think game wa- gameplay-wise it, it changes much. Uh, for the metagame, but I just don't like people putting cards in their deck f- as removal uh, and not intending to use them just to legendary rule the other person. Yeah. I don't think, you know, Heart of Kieran is oppressive in any way. Like, there, There's a lot of legitimate ways to stop it. I just don't think a lot of... I mean, it just ha- so happened that this was a pro tour where aggressive strategies, you know, rude the day. And I, I don't... You know, it just kind of happened that way. But I, I do... It's a strong card. It, it's probably going to continue to show up uh, as the weeks progress and as we move towards, you know, Amon Ket, but I mean, I don't, I don't think it's going to be, you know, wildly ruining standard or anything like that. Not, not nearly in the same breath as like Emrakul or something like so that. Since you talked about it and Wizards brought this upon themselves, does anything from the Pro Tour need to be banned? Scrap Heat Scavenger, Heart of Kieran, uh, Copycat for some reason, <laughs> uh, Anything Fatal Push? Fatal Push was in like literally every deck ever. Do you think anything will be banned or do you think anything should be banned in the upcoming bannings, which is what, four weeks from now? Five weeks from now? Four uh, weeks. Yeah. Well, I think that's hard to answer right now. So we have multiple standard tournaments coming up, and I think that's what's going to determine the future. I think if we take the top 64 the top eight from pro tour e3 volt and that's how the next two standard gps look then i would lean towards something happening on the other hand if decks react and people now that they know they have to fight the vehicles deck and things kind of normalize and we have uh, even a three deck meta where control sneaks its way back in and is fighting constrictor and mardu vehicles with some other random like aggro decks thrown in maybe the tokens deck is the tier two decks then i think that probably nothing will happen Uh, one of the biggest questions though is how much is copycat impacting the format even why it's being bad like how much is that constricting what people do with their decks or determining what is and is not viable so i think that i think that even with this horrible performance that there's some argument that you would still consider that combo being something that's just limiting the format in the same way that emrakul and some of these other cards did where it could still be on the table even after a really bad performance (laughs) constricting (laughs) (laughs) um You know, we've talked about this a lot of Pro Tours, and I think we've actually had this discussion, Seth, that, you know, you look at something like the Pro Tour, and the last time we looked at something, uh, you know, the blue-white flash list, right? Like, everyone was kind of, you know, all over the place, but you kind of determined that the blue-white flash list was, like, pretty much the best deck, and that ended up being the, uh, you know, that ended up happening. I I think once we get back to, like, a normalized, you know, again, these are the best players in the world. Like, they're not going to be playing, like, you know, a lot of people aren't going to be playing like Mardu vehicles and all this stuff as good as some of these players were. So, you know, I think a lot of people will just revert back to like the Jess guy Sahili just because it's a, a really safe option, honestly. Like it, it's, it just, a lot of people will play it. So I, I don't, I think, especially with them recognizing that they missed it, that they should ban it. Because I don't know why you would release a statement saying, yeah, you know what, guys? We pretty much missed this combo straight up. Uh, then you got to turn around and get rid of it. Wait, so you're saying people will play copycat going forward? Or you're saying it's going to yeah, be Yeah, I, I, I still think we're going to see a ton of copycat going forward. I actually disagree. I think we will not. Uh, every time we saw it on camera versus Mardu Vehicles, it looked like Mardu Vehicles was gold fishing. Like, I don't <laughs> know what that percentage matchup is, but it seemed like 80-20 or 90-10. Like, literally, they just got run over and they're sitting there like Herder, Felonier Sovereign, or... Or fell into the guardian, and they're just like, okay, I hit you for eleven, <laughs> and then they're like, well, my one four does nothing, and then they die. So I, I don't think a lot of people would play copycat. I think it, yeah, it's cool, but it's expensive, d- and r- it seems bad. <laughs> it doesn't right, but at the SCG, the two SCG events, like, did we not see copycats play aggressive decks? Like, they were still winning. Like, again, these are the best players. So obviously, the decks were tuned, and they know how to play. So you know, I think a lot of people will just play copycat and. 
more often than not, you're going to edge out some wins, even against you know a less inexperienced player playing an aggressive deck. Yeah, we'll have to see how Johnny people are. Right. Like, once the novelty of comboing someone else wears off, uh, someone out wears off, I don't think they'll play it because I think Ben Stark said like it's just a bad control deck with you know, basically eight finishers. And when you're playing control and you draw one finisher in your open hand, you feel so bad. You feel like you're going to lose. So imagine having eight of those cards, whereas a normal control deck has somewhere between like zero to three finishers. So I don't, I don't know, man. Guardian I, just looked really bad against vehicles. It cannot block anything. I'm not, disag- right, I'm not <laughs> disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that I, I still think like it. I just feel it's like one of those decks that a lot of people will play on an SCG tour or even like FNMs or whatever. And that's really the, a lot of more players than just the, the pro tour, right? Like if enough play of those players are complaining, they're not going to, they're not going to say, well, look at what happened at the pro tour. If you know, 95% of most of the players in magic are complaining about this deck and stand. So, so I think there's another option that is currently being left out of this discussion. And I agree about the Jeskai copycat thing. The problem is, like, beating vehicles with a control deck is already pretty challenging because vehicles are just so hard to deal with if you're playing shocks and harness lightnings and rass. Like, they just naturally are so good against control. And the copycat control decks are, they're sort of control decks that are playing eight bad cards is what it comes down to. And you could, even if you used all those slots on removal dedicated to beating that deck, it would still be a challenge. But the option that we've left out is maybe it's not the control copycat decks that are going to be really good. If you look at the field, they were much less played, but there was some really good performances from like Jerry Thompson, a bunch of other players that were playing more like value copycat decks with Chandra's and Cloud Blazers and Whirler Virtuosos and Rogue Refiners, almost like uh, in Eldritch Evolutions to set it up. So maybe the combo is still going to be good, but the build of control copycat just isn't great in the field. So I think that that might be where the copycat combo heads, and maybe those are the decks. And the thing about those decks that I pointed out in my By the Numbers article is they were really scattered. Like, some people were playing some Etherworks Marvels, some players were playing Eldritch Evolution and not Etherworks Marvel. some players went more Planeswalker heavy and didn't play either of the first two cards. So I think if people actually, like, hone in and tune one of those decks, that might be the right build of copycat going forward right and then once that happens are we go right back to the argument of does this need to go right i don't think anything needs to go but i i think stuff will go <laughs> just i think we're, we're entering the <laughs> modern era of pro tours where r&d is not confident in their ability to shake the meta with new cards so they're just going to ban things to keep it interesting i i i, I felt like part of the emerald copter reflector mage uh bannings was that like you have a new set coming out and you don't have any confidence that this new set will shake the current metagame, so you just ban those three. So maybe this ban- uh, this upcoming banning window, nothing happens. But I would not be surprised to see a banning coming out of Almanket, just to make sure some of the new cards get to see play. Uh, they're talking about yeah. Pro Tour 1, where they force you to play cards from Homeland's block. <laughs> maybe Wizards has kind of <laughs> gone back to that, where they're like... Well, we're banning things anyway. We might as well, right? <laughs> so we'll ban these cards, have these pushed cards to play with, and we'll sell more sets. Quick, two quick hitters before we move on that I want your opinion on. So number one, did the boringness of this Pro Tour, the lack of impact of uh, new decks and stuff, did this make you at all question the move away from two rotations a year? Like, did this have any impact on your opinion of that? Yes. They sh- they should have rotated. <laughs> uh, I I don't know that people are excited to go play against Mardu vehicles. Uh, I, I other pro tours you walk away like oh yeah Aldrazi so cool yeah Emrakul so cool now you're like well I've been playing with these like one man of three twos and stuff all this time and we get to play with it some more. So I I think rotation would have helped. I think getting rid of cards is easier to fix the metagame than adding new cards. So it's a surefire way for things to work. Uh, we're going to see with FNM attendance, we're going to see how excited people are to race their vehicles at FNM. So the next couple of weeks, I think, will be very telling and seeing how Wizards actually reacts to this. Because if we believe all the news, they've had like several quote unquote bad FNM attendance quarters in a row now, right? So they got to shake it up. <laughs> and if they, if their last move hasn't worked, what are they going to do next? I, I don't. I... 
I don't like the fact that they changed it back to the old rotation schedule, but I kind of still have to agree that they needed to do it because just I, I think just way too many people weren't weren't going to play standard at all if they if standard was just constantly rotating and they can basically never play a deck for a, you know a considerable amount of time where it just always feels like oh this deck is just going to rotate. But maybe I mean maybe that's just a great way to keep prices down, but. I mean, again, if you're still even just spending like 150, 200 bucks, which is pretty much like not too much more than that you're already paying, and you don't get to keep your deck for that long. Uh, but the other, the other flip side is, is like, man, it has to be. I, I'm honestly a little tired, and not that like I don't like the card, but we're still seeing Gideon Ally of Zendikar. Like, I, maybe it's just me, but like, doesn't that card seem like really old, like eons almost already? <laughs> No, I'm serious. Like yeah. I, I'm he's like, been around forever. That, he's too good. It, it feels like it's been around forever. And like, <laughs> like we're still seeing Gideon. It turns out when it's a like, card oh is good, God. it's good until it's banned. Yeah, <laughs> like Gideon is just too good. And, or rotates. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? Like he's just too good. Like so much value. If your opponent plays Gideon, you're automatically losing. And uh, apparently, white is the color to be in. Right. The only way we move away from Gideon is if white is no longer a good color. But white has all of the tools needed to be aggressive or mid rangey uh, with decent removal. Plus, half your deck is artifacts anyway, so it doesn't matter. So Gideon is just in the good colors right now, and he's just too good. So he will see play until he rotates, and that, that's kind of just yeah. the way it's going to be. All right, number two question. Did this at all make you miss the modern Pro Tour? Because the winner, that's where traditionally we get the modern Pro Tour any thoughts on that? Uh, I missed the modern pro tour before this even started. <laughs> it's just good to see another format, but you know, having this not be too exciting didn't help. But I don't know. I, I kind of like modern being stable. If this was a modern pro tour, then we'd be talking about why half my decks got banned and what was the point of this. So I kind of like that they're leaving modern alone and not shaking it up randomly. But at the same time, I kind of. I want to see pros play my favorite modern decks at the highest level of play, which right now we don't have a, a place to see that. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'll piggyback on that. I, I think it's good to see other formats at the played at the highest level. The unfortunate thing is when you look at like the state of standard, like do you really want that for modern? Like, do you want to be talking about what card needs to be banned like every time something comes up? I don't know. They don't spend enough resources on modern as it is. They clearly don't test for it and all that stuff. So I just feel like having a modern pro tour is kind of pointless. I mean, not to say like, you know, the, the format is pointless. I love modern and I love seeing it played, but I mean, the pro tour is just, what is it for modern? You know, like they don't, they don't test for it. They don't build cards for it. So the, the thing is though, if we're going to, my argument, a uh, counter argument would be if they're going to treat the standard pro tours like modern pro tours and just randomly ban cards to shake up the metagame and all that maybe that's not a modern problem maybe that's just a current state of magic design and development problem right well until they get to the point where they acknowledge whatever whenever we see that that they start printing like better cards to deal with other cards then i don't think really we have any reason to bring that back right now because i mean if you're telling me you 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 only focus on standard and you couldn't even like you let a two card combo that potent way like, through, you know, <laughs> what, what, what can I expect of you from modern? All right, let's move on to coverage. How did you guys find coverage this time? We had the advantage bar. We had uh, the new headphones in the feature match area. So the people there could watch, uh, we had like a weird commercial timing. They they had a lot more slides and music playing. What what were your thoughts on coverage overall? I, I liked it. I, I think they're making you know they're making strides. They're, it's in baby steps. Obviously, we're not going to see like a totally different coverage. Although it'd be nice, but you know they're adding stuff, and I, I think it was a nice break. You know, you get some slides, you got some interviews, you had the ele- you know as Seth called it the elevator music, even though it was Duels of the Plains Walker. Um, we had another thing where, I mean, Richard's going to mention it. He mentioned it in the pre-recording. That was really funny. So I'll let him talk about it. We saw Brian David Marshall with the paper airplane. It was really random, but I just, I just couldn't stop laughing about it. Uh, so, you know, and then we saw, I, I had to, I had to, you know, confirm this with both of you that they did show shots of like Dublin and stuff like that. I, I guess it was really brief, but they did. So I got, I got to at least give it to them. 
so yeah, there. I think it's getting better. I think the advantage bar was was interesting, although you know nothing you know groundbreaking. I think you know like poker has been doing that for quite some time. So, um, but yeah, overall, I thought it was good. For me, it was good news, bad news situation. Overall, I think it looked better than normal. The way the room was set up, the way they had the booth, like overlooking the floor. A lot of that stuff was really good. The actual coverage and commentary, they had LSV in the booth more often than not, which was good. He's their best broadcaster. He should be doing every match of the top eight. That's what you do. That's why when you have the Super Bowl, you bring in your A team and you don't have whoever is randomly doing the Bills games on your like six broadcast you during the regular season um but but so there was a lot of good things in that sense the things i didn't like advantage bar good idea implementation or execution was really lacking like i was kind of keeping an eye on it and it just moved very infrequently or there would it just it wasn't executed well they need to have one person whose job is to sit there and move that thing constantly like every other turn or something so you actually get more of a sense of what's happening if you don't know magic and the commercials drove me crazy in the past pro tours we would cut to a backup feature match and this one when the main match was shuffling and sideboarding, they would just go to the slides and maybe that would be fine, but they were the same slides every single time over and over again. So we saw them a million times over the course of the weekend. So uh, some stuff I liked, I think in general heading the right direction, but there's still work to be done and improvements to be made. Yeah. So I liked the hall setup. Everything looked nice. I liked the kind of the, the broadcaster booth overlooking the play area. That was pretty cool. In terms of advantage bar, I agree with Seth. It It's good in theory, but in practice, it was pretty bad. It was like either delayed. Uh, you couldn't even see it half the time. Like they had to actually point it out. Like it needs some kind of animation and a different color when something happens. So you know that the previous play was a big game changer. You know something happens. Like, you know, when there's a first down or you're in the red zone, there's like an actual animation to draw your eye there before they, they put the indicator up. So we need that. And I think just having a pro sit there and move the slider around as opposed to the co- commentators trying to do it, because the commentators are actually trying to commentate. They, they need an actual like LSV type person in the back whose sole job it is to move this thing around. And the commentators can commentate off of that, right? They can explain why the, the bar is moving. Uh, so they, they put headphones on the players so that people could view them on a TV, like right beside and hear the commentators. They should have just put the TV on the other end of the hall, or put it in a different room so you can watch there so that players don't have to sit there with like headphones on their head for like three hours playing their feature match. So I, I didn't like that and it looked kind of dumb as well. Like you have these people playing a card game wearing headphones. It, it's not like esports where the headphones are part of it. So I felt that was pretty weird. All right. What do you guys think about the team series stuff? They, they tried to sell it a lot on stream. Uh, All the teams had jerseys, and there was a lot of uh, cheering and team pride in the finals, which was pretty cool. The top eight, the Brazilian team was going nuts in the crowd. What do you guys think about all this? I I think it was good because, honestly, it was was something that has been going on for many Pro Tour before this. So I think having it officially be recognized at this point is great. And I think there's a lot of different – there was a lot of different teams I thought – for the most part, all the kind of the jerseys and the representation and you kind of knew who was on what team at this point, then everything just like 80% of the field just being the channel fireball team. So now you have like all these subset teams and you can actually talk about teams in indiv- like individual teams rather than just referring to everyone as just channel fireball and something else. And like randomly mention like MTG card mint or something like that. That is like a Chinese or Japanese based store. Uh, I, I think it was a lot easier for people to follow along, you know, breaking down all the teams and who was in those teams, uh, because again, it was, it was largely done before. So now I think it was a lot easier to follow along and it actually, honestly provided or promoted a lot of good discussion as well, even just for the commentators. For me, I think I like some aspects of it. I really liked the team aspect during the top eight, especially, I think it was a Brazilian team, Dex Army, or one of the Dex Army teams that were really like cheering and doing the wave. And it was cool to see that enthusiasm and giving the players a reason to root for someone in the top eight. 
On the other hand, I'm still kind of withholding judgment. We'll see how this goes. This was the first one, so kind of still getting a sense of who's on what team, uh, on what team, and that's gonna have to develop over a couple events. If you ask me, like name uh, half the members even of Team X, Y, or Z, unless it's like the one that has the Peach Garden Oaf guys on it, I probably couldn't do that right now. But maybe two or three pro tours down the road, I would be able to, and I'll be more invested in it. My worry is that by the time I get to that point, it's going to be a new new pro tour season, and they're just going to click the reset button, and everyone's going to switch teams again, and going to be starting over from scratch. And that would kind of defeat the whole purpose, if that's what ends up happening. Yeah, I agree. I think I like... The cheering and the camaraderie we saw in the top eight, I think that was easily the best part of the Pro Tour team series. Other than that, the teams had no meaningful impact to me. Like, they're still individual players, and still we had teams meshing together. Because the teams are only six people, and you need an eight-person pod to, to test drafting with, teams ended up going together and testing anyway. So you had these, like, super teams happening even though formally it was actually three smaller teams so that aspect of it was weird and the commentators just kept talking about jerseys like yeah that's cool but why are we talking about jerseys it has no relevance it's can you imagine the super bowl like half the commentary is about hey look how cool the new england patriots jersey is like why are we talking about this like yeah we understand they're a team but i wish there was more team dynamics or team aspect the you know one of the best things is the is it the world championships where they actually have a team and you have one person playing and two people watching and they can actually give you advice? Like to me, that's actually a team and they're doing something. Uh, you know, the, the testing aspect of it, we don't see, uh, as it's going on there. So that part doesn't really play into the storyline. So I think they got to do a better job of building the narrative and, and doing something with it, but I like it as a start. The pros play in teams. So we might as well formalize it and. It's an easy way to get sponsorship, right? You can sponsor a whole team. And we saw some new sponsors. We saw Puzzle Quest. We saw D3 Go, Mass Drop. So we're seeing a bunch of sponsors come in with this team series. So that's very exciting. So I like where it's starting, but I hope they don't just pat themselves on the back and stop here, that they bring it to the next level and keep improving it so that it ends up looking like an actual real sport. Yeah, and again, this is all really new to Magic, right? Like, I get that they kept mentioning it, but... You know, you have to remember, like, commentators of other sports, like, they've had those jerseys and they've been teams for, like, 50 years or something like that, or even longer. So, obviously, they don't need to talk about it anymore. But, you know, again, this is all just part of the verbiage of what people are used to, just as an eSport in general. Like, there's just teams playing these games all the time. So, you know, it's kind of second nature to a lot of people already because, again, you you look at just these top teams that play like MOBAs or something like that. Like people already recognize a lot of that. To to Magic, like this is fairly a new thing, and I I kind of like like you have to start somewhere. And I think you know, right, like you said, Richard, I hope they continue that because that really is the bridge to start kind of moving this along into like that esport or even just you know in that realm of uh, kind of acknowledging that. So how long until we see a TSM or a C9 Magic team? I don't know. Wouldn't that be sweet? I have no idea. That would be pretty interesting. So right now in the actual real, quote-unquote, real esports, the the actual sports teams, NBA teams and stuff, are getting into it. So they're actually buying up uh, the esports teams. So maybe now it's time for the esports teams to buy up Magic the Gathering teams. And, <laughs> hey! Uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe. it happens for Hearthstone. There's TSM players on Hearthstone. Yeah, there's there's absolutely like the big name uh you're absolutely right like NBA players uh are or former players at this point or even like GM or uh owners or GMs are like kind of looking at these uh these esports teams and you're absolutely right they're sponsoring them they're buying them so maybe it becomes big enough that they turn around and they just start elevating other games. Uh, speaking of streaming, that's the one thing we kind of missed about the Pro Tour. What did you think of the Twitch partnership thing? They On the last day of the Pro Tour, they brought in some Twitch people and talked about their emotes and all this stuff. And at first, when this was announced, I thought this was some like special relationship with Wizards and Twitch. And then as they started describing the benefits and stuff, I started to think that 
they just got a Twitch partnership. Like we have, or any big streamer that like applies for a partnership with Twitch can get. So do you think, what do you think? Do they have some special relationship with Twitch is going to be awesome for magic or did they just get partnered? Like all the other big magic streams and they're just making a big deal about it. I, I think it's kind of just like everyone else and they're making a big deal about it. Yeah. Based on <laughs> what they said, like, <laughs> that's what I was saying. talking that's to Seth live yeah. as this happened and like, like, literally, didn't they just achieve the same status as us? I'm very confused. <laughs> They're talking about emotes and 1080p and stuff. But, I mean, they, they clearly have a special connection because, unlike Joe Schmo here, it's actually Wizards, the owner of Magic the Gathering. And right. they had enough pull to bring the Twitch representatives to the Pro Tour. So even though now it looks like just a standard Twitch partnership that anyone can get, I'm I'm pretty sure <laughs> they work hand-in-hand hand with Twitch because... They are the owners of the Magic brand, and uh, they're interested in going into esports. So I believe this will, you know, show show off its true colors in the future at some point. Even though they're starting small now, and they just got the literal Twitch partnership that everyone else can get. Yeah. So do you want to? Do we want to move on to the very controversial judge ruling that came out of Pro Tour that everyone's really talking about? Uh, yes. Well, how can we yeah. have a Pro Tour without any controversy, <laughs> without any accusations? <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so basically, uh, in the last rounds of Swiss, uh, there were two players playing. One player had a Wildfest Engineer, which has a trigger at the beginning of your combat step. You can give a creature uh, plus two, plus zero, an artifact creature. And they also had a vehicle, a Heart of Kiran. So their intent, which from what we can tell, was to crew the Heart of Kiran, give it plus two, plus zero, and then attack. So what they did was they said combat, and then they waited for their opponent to acknowledge. And then he went to then try to crew his vehicle, and the, the opponent called a judge. Basically, the judge ruling was when you say combat, uh, you're actually skipping your beginning of combat step, and it's a shortcut for going to declare attackers. So if you've gone to declare attackers, uh, you've A, missed your trigger, the plus two plus zero, and B, it's too late to crew. Uh, so there was a judge call for that. The judge ended up saying, you know, that that was it. You missed everything and uh, ended up losing that game, but then came back in games two and three to win the match. But everyone was livid. Uh, there was a lot of controversy. Was this rules lawyering? Uh, why is this... Why is this, when you say combat, why does it actually not go to the step called combat, but go to declare attackers? And uh, many pitchforks were raised. A lot of people were harassing uh, the, the person who called the rules judge. And Kai Bude had a big post. And then he kind of backpedaled and said, you know, first he said you should get an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. And then he backpedaled and said you shouldn't harass this person. They were not morally wrong. And blah, 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 you know, Reddit pitchforks, Twitch chat, everyone's going absolutely nuts. Uh, so what is your take on this, guys? Was this A, rules lawyering? Uh, should should the person who called the judge be punished? B, is this ruling good? Should we change the rules? And C, should there be, you know, any anything that we can do to, should we do things to prevent this in the future? What was the problem? Oh, man. So this this is a big one. So... Oh, so many different things going on in this. On one hand, I don't think it's was wrong for someone in that situation to call a judge. Uh, there was technically illegal stuff happening. So I don't, you don't want to discourage people from calling a judge. That's the right thing to do. Even if you're not sure if your opponent's doing something wrong, that's still the correct thing to do is call the judge and let the judge sort it out. So don't want to discourage that. Watching the whole thing in context and the expression on people's faces and stuff gave me the impression that this person in this specific situation was trying to get an advantage of the game by manipulating the rules. So I don't know what was going on in the player's head, but that was what it looked like. Just watching the whole thing in context. Maybe the biggest thing that bothered me is there seemed to be a big language gap between the player that called the judge and the player who was trying to crew the vehicle who didn't seem very confident in his ability to speak English. And I felt like 
it made me feel really bad to think that this player was at a disadvantage in defending himself in this judge call and in playing a game of magic just because he wasn't as fluent in English as his opponent, whether or not that's true. And as far as the big picture, the rule definitely, I believe, needs to be changed. In the old days, nothing really happened on your combat step. There was a very small number of cards that did anything, and most of those cards didn't really see much play. They were weird old, like... I don't even remember all of them, but these weird fringe cards from like Ice Age and Alliances that sometimes said at the beginning of combat. But now with vehicles and Toolcraft Exemplar and Weldfast Engineer, Wizards is really pushing stuff happening at the beginning of combat. And if Wizards is going to push that, there needs to be a way to deal with this because that step actually matters now. And if saying combat doesn't mean go to the beginning of combat and trigger your beginning of combat abilities, I could imagine this being a big issue that's coming up over and over again all the time. So I think that the rule does need to be changed to catch up with modern magic card design where the beginning of combat step actually does matter. I was really disappointed in, in the reaction um, of the community's reaction. Thian, Thian I, I, I'm going to butcher his name, Nguyen? did nothing wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. He called a judge. I mean, that's that's it. I mean, that's really what happened. He called a judge. He was unsure about what his, his opponent was doing. He said, go to combat. He said, okay. And he's expecting, okay, he's going to attack, st- start attacking with these creatures. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to have this trigger go off, and I'm going to crew this and all that. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute, what? Like, what are you talking... So... All he wanted was some clarification on what his opponent, which seemed to me, again, if we go back and watch it, didn't really articulate that very well. Now, I guess the, the language barrier comes in, but listen, it happens. I mean, when you have these international players coming, you have someone from, you know, one country playing against someone from another country. They don't, they can't really discuss anything almost at all. I mean, it's going to happen just like we watch. Any kind of sport out there, the rules are, are sometimes just because you don't really know all the rules or, you know, there's some shortcuts or something like that. Like there's some obscure rules in a lot of these sports that come up sometimes and people get outraged. But I mean, just because you don't know it doesn't mean you shouldn't be outraged about it. I mean, it happens. Does it cost uh, players or even teams sometimes a, a tournament or match or something like that or a game? Yes, but. Again, he didn't do anything wrong to me. And what's even more sad is that he has to make a statement on Facebook. And then that was later posted on Reddit or something like that. um, Apologizing to the community for the sake of spirit of sportsmanship. He didn't do anything wrong. I I didn't feel like he did anything wrong. and I didn't feel like he was trying to gain an unnecessary advantage over his opponent when his opponent has just as much you know, responsibility to articulate what he's trying to do. Even if you guys can't, you know, two players can't come to a common, like vocal ground, you can say like, listen, I'm, you know, this is going to, you know, point, use your, your words, you know, use something to say, like, use your words, use, you know, write something down, have something. Maybe people should start getting one of those little, like Ouija. Uh, I don't know what the hell they're called. Um, uh, those little things that people, I, I see like these little tablets people start writing on. You can get them from like Best Buy. Maybe start writing down your, your, your phases if you can't, you know, and just start pointing to the phase. Just like MTGO or something like that. Well, so, so here's the problem. So I agreed with your first half of that, but not the second half. The main problem was he said combat, which meant he wanted to go to the beginning of combat, but the rules interpreted that that means go to declare attackers, skipping your beginning of combat, which makes no sense whatsoever, right? So uh, for my broader perspective, this is how I view it. Someone got screwed here. Obviously, the Brazilian player got screwed. They know how to play magic. They know what they want to do. But there's a technicality in the rules that says when you use this language, it means this. English-speaking players, we all have made that mistake, right? Uh, Martel said he got screwed with something similar like that. A bunch of players said, oh, you know, I, I knew about it because someone got me at FNM the previous week, right? That's native English speakers are getting kind of caught by this rule. Now imagine if you're non-English, right? Now it's even worse. So he totally got screwed and that's on the DCI, right? It is not on uh, the other player. It's perfectly valid to call a judge. He didn't misrepresent anything. He didn't deceive or do anything wrong. All he did was call a judge and the judge sorted the situation. And the judge was also correct, right? That's how the rules are written. 
he was doing his job and he said, you know, this is, this is what happened. You skipped your step, right? Where we went wrong is the actual rules themselves are dumb, right? Like why, why does, why, when I name the combat step, why am I actually skipping the beginning of combat and going to attackers? Who knows? Uh, but, but it, yeah, the rules could be dumb, but that's exactly what they are written at that time. So I, I understand people even on, on every language is getting, you know, is getting burned on that. But uh, maybe again, this is the pro tour. Like if you need a refresher, I mean, you have time to go and back and look through the, through the, the through, through the rules. But this, this, this even goes beyond that. Like people were getting really nasty about this. And I, I, you know, they were going to these places where, you know, had no even, were totally outside of the realm of what happened. And now it's getting to a point where people are going to get vilified for, for calling a judge at a pro tour. Wait, what, then what? People should just not call a judge anymore because he, the dude had to make a, a, an apology statement for calling a judge and people were going even further. Oh, you had a smug look on your face? Like, what's that about? Yeah, so so that's the witch hunt that happened afterwards, which I think we can all agree is uncalled for. And the community always overreacts and there's always witch hunts. And it also leads to the stigma of calling judges. My 100% pet peeve is when people get pissed when you call a judge because they think... You're insulting their intelligence. You think, uh, you know, you're implying they don't know how to play the game or something like that. Whereas if I don't know what's going on, I want a judge to help explain, right? You know, when a wide receiver catches a ball, you don't get, you know, you, you don't get all pissed off that there's an instant replay that a judge comes in and takes a look at it, right? Like that's just part of the game, right? And they're just enforcing the rules. You're not dumb. You're not unathletic or anything. So I right. hate that this will reinforce the stigma that calling a judge is bad. Because calling a judge is 100% the correct thing to do when you're confused. When there's a disagreement, when you're confused, when you want clarification, you call a judge, right? And in this case, the judge enforced the rules that people didn't like, but the outrage should be at the rules, not at the player, not at right, calling the right. judge, not at the judge himself. He's just doing his job as well. Not even the head judge. The head judge is also just enforcing the rules. But I think on Reddit and Twitch, people's anger was just misdirected everywhere. And... uh Tian was the one who got the bulk of it, right? And he did not deserve it. And it wrecked him, you know, for day two, you know, basically got in his head and he can't play. And then now yeah, he's kind of yeah. the villain and you've buried another pro player like Reddit tends to do quite often, right? Like just someone gets on the bad side of Reddit and then boom, they're gone. They're blacklisted. So that's what I don't like about this. Uh, but the actual ruling itself, I think, is actually dumb. And Wizards needs to address it. Like Seth said, it was written in a time where nothing happened at the beginning of combat, but now stuff actually happens at the beginning of combat, so they need to come address it somehow, and hopefully there's a good answer to this. Uh, because this rule was made to prevent rules lowering in gaming, right? Because you could technically say, go to combat, wait for your opponent to, like, cryptic command tap your guys, and then, like, untap or uh, activate, like, a raging ravine or something. So this rule helps you prevent that, but then it leads to this other bad case. So Wizards needs to go back and kind of figure out what language and what you need to do uh, to make this not happen uh, anymore. Yeah, I think I can agree on that uh, on that sense. So, I mean, even for me, like turning around and say, you know, I can kind of see where I was wrong there. But and I, and I get the rule should probably be changed. You're absolutely right. It's a, it's a little murky and, and not really well established, although people were pulling up judges articles and all this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different. Maybe it just kind of can get cleaned up a bit. So at least there's that. But I mean, this was totally, I mean, this was really, uh, really unfortunate. No, no more witch hunts. The whole thing. <laughs> no more. Yeah, witch. the whole thing. But it was even, it was even beyond a witch hunt. I mean, the, the, really, it was, it was, it got downright, you know, unpleasant. Oh, you, and that is, I don't. <laughs> I don't think this is any worse than what we see all the time. Like well, that's also it was bad, only, right? All, no, all it is are bad. Yeah. No, they they are all bad, but it, making this sound like it doesn't happen all the time in the magic community is ridiculous. Like if you're if we had the maybe the biggest problem with the community in general is its propensity to go witch hunting f over nothing. Like we it was Kent Ketter for picking up his rest in peace and moving it slightly got 
kicked off of his professional team. Uh, I just saw on Reddit today, someone at a, uh, one of the regionals drew three cards with their faithless looting and apologized about it, but he's a cheater and we can't have him in the game and we don't punish cheaters hard enough. So th- this is a, a, a systemic issue with the magic community. Yes. It is propensity to wish on. And for me, this is just the latest in a long line of examples of this really dirty part of the community that i don't like and that i hope changes no i mean this i think went a little further that this was really grasping seth i mean we've seen some really uh, kind of you know questionable things from the community in terms of these witch hunts but really he was smug like he had a smug face like that's why he should be banned off the pro i mean come on i I, I, I think i agree with Chaz here this was worse because he literally did nothing wrong he didn't do at, at least anything wrong. In the wrong. other cases, there was an accidental mistake. <laughs> it shouldn't be branded as cheating, but <laughs> right, you know right. they, they made an error. In this case, he literally did nothing wrong. He called a judge. He didn't misrepresent facts. He didn't do anything deceiving. And people were knocking him from how you know for how his face looks. Like what? So I, I think in this case it's worse. But I agree with you in general that this is not something new. Right. That mm-hmm. people love witch hunts on Reddit, and uh, it's just bad for the game. Right. Like it's really bad. If you knew the, the inner details of how this works, you're like, okay, the rule is dumb, people have pitchforks, fine. But as a casual person, you're like, wow, magic. People just cheat all over the place. Like, what? Like, every day there's a new cheater at the Pro Tour. It's like, why Why should I even play? I'm just going to get beaten by cheaters, right? Like, it just has a really bad narrative. Yeah. yeah. Especially, I, I mean, you can't ignore what was being said during the finals. So I, I won't even touch that subject. Oh, that's a whole nother debate about whether... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we don't have so, to get into it, but yeah. someone who's banned <laughs> yeah. for cheating coming back and playing and how we handle people that actually are found guilty of cheating is that's a whole nother debate that people like to have. But I know for me, like I posted on Twitter a few minutes ago, seeing these witch hunts come up so often, it makes me not want to play in paper tournaments. As someone who's like known in the community and anyone who knows me and has watched my stream knows that I'm not going to try to cheat, but I'm also the kind of guy that sometimes uh pithing needles my own pithing needle or like cast a spell into my own chalice of the void and i'm not trying to pull one over i'm doing it on magic online where there's no advantage that's just like me but i know that if i played paper tournaments sooner or later something like that would happen to me on camera and then there's going to be this huge uproar i'm going to have to defend myself that i'm cheating even though i know that wasn't anywhere near my intention so seeing these witch hunts really turns me off to the idea of playing tournament paper magic because of how these witch hunts happened and how easy they are to get started and become a huge issue if anything, on MTGO, it's reverse cheating because you know how many times I've F6 through a combat phase completely. <laughs> so, I mean, I can understand. But, no, I don't, I don't think it should dissuade people. It was, it's not riddle. I mean, c- contrary to what people are saying on Reddit, you know, using this as just another way to say, oh, look at what all this horrible stuff goes on in paper all the time. Like, people are just cheating left and right, this, that, and the other thing, which wasn't even part of what happened. I mean, the, the guy called a judge. I mean, I don't know what that is, but other than what it is. Uh, but you know, it shouldn't dissuade people from, I mean, people do make mistakes and I I do think it is getting a little out of control to say, you know, a mistake is cheating. You know, a mistake is a mistake. I mean, we've seen it, we've seen it actually, uh, you know, in one game closer to the later rounds where one person got a warning, then another person got a warning and then a, a person got a warning the following turn just for making mistakes. I mean, it's it's grueling. You're playing Magic for like 15 plus hours, like 20 hours. You're going to make a legitimate mistake. It doesn't mean you're automatically cheating. I mean, I think we have to really sit back as a community and look at and, and d- dissect really what is a mistake and what is cheating. Because, you know, people are losing, you know, th- their their livelihoods over this. I mean... People are getting kicked off teams or what have you, don't write for websites anymore, this, that, and the other thing, just because of a mistake. Yeah, it's kind of like trial by public outroar. Like, can you imagine if actual trials took place like this? Because this is what's happening for Magic, right? Like, if if there's suspected cheating, the judges and the DCI should go gather evidence and do what they need to do and not, you know, just a bunch of armchair DCI judges, you know, watching a Twitch stream, you know, kind of chiming in and, and deciding the fate of this person. But that's that's where we are. That's the internet. I mean, we're talking about cheating, but if you just look at, like, YouTube comments and stuff, people can get extremely toxic uh, in cases that are not even warranted. Like, does a punt require you to, like, berate this person? No, but it happens. 
So I think as a community, we need just to be more accepting. And I don't know, like in terms of actual gaming communities, I think we're actually pretty good. If you look at something like League of Legends, like, oh my god. I agree. <laughs> right? Any MOBA is like a billion times more toxic, but that doesn't mean we're in a good place, right? Just because we're not the worst doesn't mean it's acceptable. I think we still need to be better. We need to be more accepting. And uh, just imagine every time you play a game, someone's looking over your shoulder, not just someone, say like 20,000 people pointing at every single flaw that happens and calling you a cheater. Because that's what these pros have to do. You know, at F&M, you, you, you screw up, no one notices, no one cares, and, it, and we move on. But at the pro tour, everyone's suddenly an expert now and suddenly you're branded a villain or a cheater or something. And... I think that's just not cool. I think we should, I don't know, not say anything. Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you would do as yeah. a commentator, but yeah. just, it's the current system is not working. Yeah. And it's just, this was a good way to rehash all this, but this had nothing to do even with anything of that. So I, that's why I felt it was really more egregious to me because again, the, the end did nothing wrong. Yeah. I think the only good news is wizards will take a good hard look at this rule. Because this rule makes no sense. It's like saying, like, during your second main phase, when you say no, it means yes. When you say ne- yes, it means no. And you're like, okay, that's <laughs> right, the rules. Right. But, like, it just is not intuitive anymore, right? Like, you have to kind of wrap your head around it and, and deal with it when you shouldn't have to, right? It should just naturally make sense. So I really hope Wizards does something about this. And maybe you have to be explicit now and there's no shortcutting for this step. I, I don't know. Oh, all right. We're all yeah. worked up. Should we move on to fish mail? All right. To, to end things on a positive note. So, well, let's, let's move from one conspiracy theory to another. <laughs> Our first fish mail question from at Andrew Cowell. Uh, Alpha Investments had a video on printing less of certain cards based on sheet length. Fact or fiction? So this is referring to the fact that some commons or uncommons are more rare than others. I'm not even going to get fact, into this. Fact, fiction, really or unknown? It. I, I have no idea. I, I wouldn't even know how he would know. I'm going to go with fiction because I did some research on this after I saw the question and I could not find anything anywhere with anyone talking about this. So uh, I don't know why how Alpha Investments, uh, who likes kind of being clickbaity and stirring things up, discovered this thing that no one else has discovered in the last 25 years of magic. So I'm going <laughs> to lean towards no, but unknown. I, I actually, yeah, I, so it's unknown, but I actually think he's correct uh, because Magic has done this in the past and just the logistics of printing, like you have to print a sheet of paper, that sheet of paper holds a fixed number of cards. So if the number of commons or uncommons isn't an exact multiple of that, like what do you do? So I just think from like the actual physical printing process, this has to be the case, but uh, no one, no one knows unless you actually work at a Watsi printer. But I, I would think this is not as far fetched as it sounds. And I given mean, the price of Fatal Push, like WTF. <laughs> but can't you just like they have uncut sheets? Wouldn't that be the way to like figure it out by just looking at what a sheet looks like? Are those uncut sheets actual uncut sheets or just made for display? Uh, I, if, it, if it's the actual real one, then yeah, we can actually take a look, and then we'll know. I believe they are actual uncut sheets. I, I, I think they're actually that's my understanding well. yeah. of what they are. Yeah. The, the other thing is we can actually count the number of commons and uncommons in a set, and they're usually pretty fixed, right? But sometimes they deviate from that, and as long as they all fit a certain pattern, because they all got to fit in the same printing specifications, so that's another clue to look into it. Well, we will have to investigate and get back to this maybe next cast. Remind us. Because I think we can look at uncut sheets and try to figure it out. But I, I do agree some of the other data he presented was weird. Like, I opened a thousand boxes and had ten less rares. Like, okay, that's that's not <laughs> that, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's not a, a piece of data to support that claim. Uh, next question. At Viper Johnny B. Why the hate for Pokemon TCGO? Moto can learn a lot, like code cards. Uh, TCC just put up a cool video. Thoughts? Yeah, I don't. I don't actually know why. Didn't we just talk about this? I, I don't know why they hate for Pokemon TCGO. I thought it was a pretty good gap between a paper game and a and a um, an online presence. Although, again, didn't you discuss this, Richard? Like, you're the one that actually has played. Yeah, I was actually playing this morning, and you guys saw oh, on Discord. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think this was related to my last comment. Uh, so I don't. I actually think Pokemon TCG is really good. Uh, but I was saying there are some aspects where Moto does things better. So obviously gameplay, 
uh, you know, the actual board, the graphics, the performance of it, uh, even the gaming aspects like daily rewards, awesome. Even the pack scanning to get physical ones, uh, the economy is different, but that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, what I was commenting on last time was other things Moto does better, or at least the Moto community, like buying a deck. So I was saying we all trash Moto, but Moto's not as terrible as we all make it out to be. There's actually some positives to Moto that, you know, Moto has better things than, than other games, but I think Pokemon TCGO is an actually really good game, and I was actually playing it this morning, so I like it. Uh, I will say that the uh, that the code thing is becoming one of my pet peeves. You can't just have Moto codes. Like when you ask for every paper product to come with a code that you get on Magic Online, what you're asking for is a complete rebuild of Moto from ground up. So just be aware of that. Like I think that's a fine idea, but it's with the current system of redemption and prices and how magic online is. It's not like you can just flick a switch and have these redemptions happen. Like that requires a ton of stuff to happen to get to that point, a ton of other stuff to happen. Yeah, first. It changes the redemption economy. Yeah. Uh, but one thing they could do, which I really like is uh dual decks or intro packs, like the, the planeswalker deck, give you a code uh, that lets you bring it online and, all of those cards are locked to your account, so you can't trade them or you can't sell them, and then allow you to play free leagues with other people with theme decks. I think that would be easy. It doesn't warp your economy, and it gets people started on Magic Online. Uh, all the decks are balanced, theoretically, because they're all like theme decks. And that's what, that's what Pokemon does, and I think it works really well. Uh, next question, Funk de la Fletch. What is more challenging, competitive, competitive play online or in paper? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really pertinent question because after everything we just talked about, you would think uh, playing online because uh, whew, it's it's pretty tough uh, playing out there in paper these days. Well, well, interesting answer to this is LSV was talking at the Pro Tour this weekend about testing for limited and how testing limited even with the pro teams is actually pretty hard because you have such a varied skill level so in his opinion he thought that magic online the most competitive drafts like the competitive drafts on magic online were actually better testing tools for someone than some of the pro team testing for limited because the average player ability is just as good or better so i think that magic online tournaments are more competitive than a lot of paper tournaments definitely way more than fnm level stuff and probably getting close to like day two of a gp level competitive if you're playing the most competitive magic online tournament so i think it's even more competitive than day one of a gp yeah competition wise i agree with you seth uh in terms of actual playing obviously paper you gotta remember your triggers uh you can accidentally skip your beginning of combat step too so uh if you play Legacy online and then play Legacy in paper, oh boy, <laughs> the first couple games are rough as you basically <laughs> do everything wrong and uh, you rack up enough warnings to actually kick you out of a tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Next question from Sneaky Fat Kid 7 How do you organize rotating standard cards to sell off at an event? Mm, <sighs> I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting this. Uh, do you even need I to guess, don't you just like, bring them to a vendor and then they just sort them for oh, you and then they give you a oh, price? Well, yeah, but I think maybe they're asking, well, this person is asking, like, how would you, I guess, transport or present, like, these cards? Like, you don't just hand them a stack. Obviously, you would want to use the long boxes, the 1K I, long boxes. I think if the question is how do you actually more. sort them, sort them... I think it doesn't especially matter, and the vendor will probably s mostly sort them. If you give them a pile of rares, they will tell you how much they'll pay for them. But I would try to, beforehand, uh, put them in goldfish or something. Be familiar with the prices. Uh, a lot of vendors are really good, but you want to know if it's a card that retails for $10 and the vendor you go to is only offering $2 because right. they have a huge supply or something that maybe you don't want to sell to them. So I would probably try to arrange them roughly by their value so you know yourself before the vendor tells you what they're willing to pay for them. All right. Uh, next question from at Alan Harrison. I once put my cards down mid-game. Then forgot about them until I lost. What was the worst punt you ever made? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, 
I mean, the list of mine is pretty endless, but one that keeps coming back is casting Piffing Needle and naming my own Piffing Needle. That's kind of a, a classic uh, one of my puns, I guess. You wouldn't see this because I don't play MTGO anymore, but I frequently f- miss my combat step entirely on MTGO. Did did you say combat and it just took you right to <laughs> declare attackers? No, actually, I just had F6 and it just went right on by. Just didn't even give me a chance. So actually, it was worse. At least with com- at least with saying combat, I would have had a chance to at least attack. But no, it just went whoop right on by. Second main phase, I was like, oh. Well, I guess I lose, and it's history from there. So I may or may not have, on more than one occasion, Maelstrom Pulse my own goif away. That's, oh. uh, that's a very common thing to do, where you're not paying attention to your board. You're like, yeah, Maelstrom Pulse is just removal. And then you're like, oops. <laughs> uh, last question from Rob Condon. How do you guys feel about the new sponsored Puzzle Quest tweets? Is this the new norm from pros? I thought those were troll tweets. I didn't realize that those were actually sponsored. I thought it was like a running joke between like Finkel and Kai and those guys. What were so. the tweets? Wow. I thought they were just like, I'm so proud to be part of Team Puzzle Quest. Are those not the tweets? <laughs> I, I have no idea. Oh, uh, there were there were tweets right after the Pro Tour with like Finkel saying, oh, uh, Magic Puzzle Quest is the most played game on my phone. I'm, I love this game so much. And then like Paul Rietzel oh. was like flat saying the same thing. Like, Oh, and I thought they were just like trolling and joking around, but maybe those were real tweets that they were paid to <laughs> paid to uh, promote. I mean, given that Moto is not on their phone, that may be legitimately true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like it. Yes. I, I think, I don't think there were enough sponsors. Uh, I think the jerseys were quite sparse. <laughs> I think the jerseys could have been more NASCAR with, more sponsors on there but we're not there yet so any sponsor i think uh for esports and magic in general is is pretty good you know even watching the super bowl so many mobile game videos there uh commercials there so if they're willing to pay millions of million dollars at a super bowl like how about i give you a gaming convention full of nerds playing a card game (laughs) like do you want to stick your logo on my shirt I think we can do something. I think we can get sponsorship even more. And I'll take the random weird tweet about a random video game if it means improving the Magic Pro scene. Well said. Uh, that is all of our fish mail for this week. So if you have questions, tweet at us at MTG Goldfish, hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll answer your questions. Awesome. Yeah, and those questions are always really great. They promote a lot of great discussion. We're, we're happy to do it. A lot of really, uh, they, they make us think, that's for sure. Um, so I, I think that's about it, uh, gentlemen. We get a Star City Games open. We're back to that. So that will happen this weekend. And um, yeah, I think we'll have some, maybe some other things pop up to uh, I, talk about next time. I think there's a GP too, maybe. Right. I think you're right. Yes, I think you're and, right. And one of the good things to come out of the Twitch stuff they were talking about and we kind of glossed over this because we were talking Pro Tour this week, is they're covering almost twice as many Magic events live this year. So yeah. pretty much if there is a GP on a weekend or multiple GPs, one of them is being covered every single weekend there is a GP, which almost doubles the amount of coverage, which that's going to be super awesome. So make sure to uh, tune in on Twitch to check out the tournaments. It'll be interesting to see what standard looks like the next couple weeks. I think that's going to determine a lot about bannings and the format moving forward the next week or two yeah absolutely and and it's just great because you know a long week you know people will finally get to see those on twitch and i think that will gloss over a lot of the complaints that people just want to watch these on twitch over the weekend a large gp uh get some ideas for their deck going forward um so really interesting time to at least monitor standard uh so yeah uh gentlemen it's been a great cast we will do this again next week and thanks everyone for joining us this is going to be the mtg goldfish crew signing out